So just a few intros while they're sitting down. Uh, Rodrigo, our moderator here, is Associate General Counsel at Paradigm. Prior to joining Paradigm, he was outside counsel to crypto investors uh, and entrepreneurs at Cooley LLP. Prior to that, Rodrigo was a founding member of DLX Law, a blockchain and crypto-focused boutique. Rodrigo earned a JD from MBA Law School and a BA in, in Philosophy and Political Science from Middlebury College. Um, joining us is also Ryan Miller. Ryan is general counsel of FTX US, a regulated cryptocurrency exchange. Prior to joining FTX US, Ryan was partner at and co-head of Sullivan and Cromwell's Commodities, Futures, and Derivatives Group. Ryan is a member of the Derivatives and Future Law Committee of the American Bar Association, and he's a member of the Executive Committee of the Futures Industry Association's Law and Compliance Division. Ryan previously worked at the US Commodities Future Trading Commission as legal counsel to CFTC Chairman Gary Gensler. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming today. Um, so uh, to start off, I wanted to maybe lay the ground as to what the general arc of the discussion that we're hoping to have is. Uh, and I, I wanted to start pretty generally talking about uh, you know, regulation and technology and then try to narrow down uh, into some of the US specific issues and then uh, get Ryan's input on some of the FTX specific issues. Um, so pretty ambitious agenda for 30 minutes, but we have a great speaker and we're at MIT, so I figured we'd swing for the fences. Um, so to start off on kind of thinking about what the role of regulation and, and technology are, I think there's two points that I'd like to kind of get your input on here is first, what do you think the role of regulation is in kind of fomenting and, and also, um, I guess, providing consumer protection vis-a-vis -vis emerging technologies? And then the second one, which I think is more crypto specific, is if one of the main benefits of, of Bitcoin and, and uh, blockchain is the ability of it to avoid the censorship, um, is that inherently opposed to regulation? Yeah, re really good question. So it, what, what is regulation? What's it supposed to do? And you know, is, is it any different for crypto than it is for any other industry? And I, I think maybe we'll leave that for the end of my initial remarks. I'm, I'm not sure it is. But sort of, sort of what is the role of regulation um, with any emerging technology? And, and financial services is a great starting point because financial services is just the continuance of emerging technology in the passing back and forth of value between folks. So what, what's the role of government there? And, and I think it's two things. And the first one, I'll go deeper on, but it's, it's to stop the bad stuff. Uh, but we have to define what is the bad stuff. At the same time, it's to do so in a way, and, and now it's, this is the second job of government, I'll come back to stopping the bad stuff. Um, it's to do so in a way that doesn't chill innovation. It's very easy to say. Um, what, what does it mean to not chill innovation? It's that folks can take risk, um, bring new services to market, try to create new, new pockets of value um, w without being afraid of a major violation, a major investigation, and going to jail, sort of at the end of it. And the going to jail piece ties back to what, what are the don't do bad stuff that government's supposed to stop? And I, I put it in four buckets. You mentioned customer protection or consumer protection. I, I think of it mostly because I come from a trading background, but investor protection. And it's about disclosure and transparency. What the government wants you to do and what they should want you to do if you're an innovator, an entrepreneur, or a business person, tell people what you're doing in a way that's truthful, um, that's, that's materially complete, um, and that's not fraudulent. And so that, that to me is disclosure, transparency around investor protection. There's, there's a few other pieces of what government's supposed to do that, that I like to add on to it. The second is, is market integrity, and that, that's stepping back from a single company, entrepreneur, uh, creator, and looking across a market more generally. Is this market um, staking or putting away fraud? Is it taking, are the rules in place such that folks cannot take advantage of users of this market? Is the market efficient? Does it, does it avoid manipulation? So that's the market integrity piece of it. And then I think the, a third bucket that's important is just financial crimes generally. E even if a market's efficient, you can still go to it to do money laundering. You could still do activity that might violate sanctions laws. So that's what the government's trying to solve for. What they need to do so is create rules that don't stifle innovation at the same time. And the, the way that we would have always said that at FTX is principles-based regulation is really important. Um, the rules should be 
focused on what the market is doing, but not so prescriptive that it actually requires you to, to it, that it defines your business. The government should not be business model promoting, it should be business model agnostic, it should be technology agnostic. Um, great, thank you. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add about uh, Bitcoin in, in particular and, and how its inherent anti-censorship uh, characteristics uh, interplay with regulation? I mean, Bitcoin, and, and I'll say digital assets more broadly, um, b brought a lot of these questions to the forefront. Financial crimes is where the government first started to look at the digital asset industry in Bitcoin, particularly around anti-money laundering. And, and the government realized very quickly, if these things have value, then it's a way to move value back and forth. And our laws, at least in the United States, around sanctions and money laundering, don't tie to the US dollar. Anything of value can be used to um, launder assets, launder value, evade sanctions. And so I think the government came very quickly to the table, 2012, 2013, and said, look, our financial crimes laws apply to this space. Um, that didn't mean overnight that some of the anonymous features of digital assets were useless, but it meant that if you were dealing in sums of value that were above whatever the thresholds are in the US, it was pretty clear that some regulation was going to apply. So it, it, I, I think it's less attention than an acknowledgement that, look, Bitcoin became a thing of value. Um, you know, bricks of gold are things of value and are pretty anonymously transported, but they're totally covered by our US financial crimes laws. Great. Um, so now maybe zooming in a little bit and, and thinking about the US um, in particular, uh, I'd love to get kind of like your general thoughts about how the US has responded um, in, reg in terms of regulation, and then maybe putting on our professor hats, thinking about grading them across the different um, areas that you mentioned, investor protection, market integrity, financial crimes. Sure, and one of the great things about speaking in open panels is someone here writes down what I say and they publish it in an article and it's not exactly what I said. So I'm gonna be very careful about grading, grading the regulators. Um, but what have they done? Like what, does, what is the US regulatory program for digital assets? Huge topic, you could do a whole week long panel on it. But we've brought our markets regulatory programs to digital assets, is very straightforward. The spot exchanges, places like FTX, Coinbase, You've got a 50 state regulatory program that is, is regulating our businesses similar to money transmission businesses like Western Union um, and, or as money services businesses. Um, it looks a lot like a check cashing type regulatory program. You've got you've to do KYC on your customers. You've got to make sure suspicious transactions are reported to the U US financial crimes authorities. And, and, that, and, and, and basically you've got to make sure you've got disclosures um, that cover material completeness that are, that are not fraudulent. And that's really how the spot exchanges have been regulated today. Um, from a markets regulation perspective, there are two federal markets regulators who are just starting to get into crypto, and, and so the CFTC and the SEC. CFTC regulates derivatives, the SEC regulates securities. We've seen the CFTC look at crypto two different ways. First, um, where you had derivatives, so futures, swaps, options, on digital assets. The CFTC said those are clearly regulated by us. No one was surprised by that, and I think the CFTC has done a pretty good job. They've required different futures contracts to be submitted to the CFTC before they can go live. The other thing the CFTC has done is from time to time where there's been manipulation or fraud in a digital asset market that didn't involve derivatives. So in the underlying spot market, the CFTC has stepped in and said, look, we have general manipulation and fraud authority over the spot market, has nothing to do with derivatives, nothing to do with futures, but where there's manipulation and fraud, we technically can get involved there too. And they've done that a couple times, which is an interesting development. They've avoided doing that to any large extent in traditional commodities, and they've started to look into it in digital assets. One thing that I think is really interesting there is, does that become an entry point for the CFTC, a federal markets regulator, to a broader regulatory program for spot markets. I, would, I, would, I think that's an interesting idea. I think we all ought to spend time thinking about it, but a federal regulator for the spot markets is something FTX thinks is a good idea. It's something we've talked to the CFTC and the SEC about. We've talked to state regulators about. There is, there is at least statutory authority for the CFTC to look at fraud and manipulation, and they might be able to build on that to maybe expand what they're looking at in the spot markets. Switch to the SEC, and they've, they've really looked at it from the traditional securities law perspectives. If they see a token, a project, a coin economy that to them 
looks like this traditional word investment contract or securities transaction, the SEC has stepped in and said the traditional securities laws apply. They've, they've not really done anything to date that I think I would call sort of innovative or you know, paving the way for the next generation of digital assets or digital securities. There's a few no action letters that, um, that, I, that I think are the beginning of a lot of rules and guidance that's gonna continue to come out of the SEC, but today the big starting point is, is a particular token or, or, token or coin an investment contract, and if so, you know, were the securities laws complied with? Um, so maybe one other focus of regulation has been systemic risk. Sure. Um, so I'd like to get your take. Like, what do you think the systemic risk implications of crypto today are, and, and how is the government starting to think about this? Yeah, so systemic risk, um, for some in this room who are as old as me, um, and many who are much not as old as me, younger, um, Dodd-Frank really is the most recent moment we had as a society to, to think about what is systemic risk. You had several large global financial institutions create a bunch of non-transparent risk on their balance sheets that when the risk environment changed in the markets, created huge unfunded liabilities um, across some really big balance sheets, and you, interestingly, across some really big balance sheets that supported some other lines of business banking, insurance, and a few others that were really critical to the functioning of the global economy. When you put those business lines at risk, banking, insurance, a, a few other financial products, um, at risk to cover the losses of you know, basically dark trading and non-transparent trading, policymakers globally reacted very harshly. They said, these risks got way too big. We've got to create rules that impose transparency, disclosure, record keeping, capital requirements. So that, that's, that's what systemic risk can be. Something can get too big, creates a threat to the smooth and efficient functioning of traditional financial markets. And the way the government responds, uh, transparency, disclosure, registration, capital requirements. Now the size of risk that I, that I think um, really created, th there was the focus of much of 2008, 2009 financial crisis was many and many of trillions of dollars. Um, the size of over-the-counter derivatives markets, hundreds of trillions of dollars of notional, and so really huge, really gigantic. Is crypto now a systemically risky thing? Is it somewhere we've got to start having these types of discussions? I don't know the answer to that. Um, on a given day, the crypto market, depending how you add it up, you're just looking at the value of all the coins, basically where they last traded, times how many coins are out there. You call it two trillion, you call it three trillion, give or take. It's not the hundreds and trillions that we have in the global over-the-counter derivatives markets, but it's real. I mean, two trillion is one-tenth of the US GDP, maybe, maybe a little less than that now. When you look at derivatives on crypto, each day we have anywhere from 100 billion to 200 billion in notional of crypto derivatives traded globally. 90% um, plus, give or take, outside of the United States, a much smaller amount inside the United States. Is it systemically important? I, I don't think so right now, because systemically important, systemic importance ties to, is it a threat to the traditional financial system? The way that folks access banking, insurance, lending, et cetera. We've not seen the traditional financial institutions step into crypto, and one of the reasons they haven't done so is because they know they have to answer this question. Once they've got crypto exposures on their balance sheet, is it a threat to the traditional banking products that they're providing? I think it's, it's, a, it's a thinking exercise that many of the banks are doing actively right now. You know this, I know this. And I think they want to find out where can we bring in the digital asset ecosystem to the products that our users want, our customers want, um, but also address our the obligations we have as global financial institutions to not introduce systemic risk. Um, one other point that you mentioned as part of systemic risk is uh, like transparency of, of these um, assets or these instruments. Is there a distinction there to be made between crypto assets, which are uh, theoretically more transparent than traditional uh, financial instruments? I mean, the transparency, so, so yes. Um, crypto, you could argue, for, for any transaction that's taking place, you know, involving the blockchain, like interchain transfers or, you know, transactions between chains, the world can see it, the world can do the math and get a sense of the volume of what's going on. 
However, I, th I think at the end of the day, when we're thinking about risk and buildup of risk, we're looking at centralized risk at an institution or even a, a central clearing counterparty, for example. And that, you can't get a sense of that just by looking at publicly available blockchain data. You, you, you need some level of transparency, and, and we have this. In the United States, in the EU, in most of Asia, every derivatives transaction has to be reported, crypto or otherwise, and that, that's the beginning of sort of transparency into where the, the global markets are trading. Um, so, having kind of examined the U.S. Uh, you know regulatory reaction and gotten Ryan's grading, which for those you know reporting, he said they've done amazing. Um, I'd like to look forward now and think about policy. Um, what are the main kind of policy initiatives, or, or how do you see the policy um, discussion playing out in the midterm? Okay, so how, how is policy going to play out in the midterms? You, you're, you're talking... So I didn't mean like the, the midterm elections. I mean not the short term, but like the not, medium term. So not the elections, right? Good. Or, or the elections. I, I can avoid <laughs> politics. Good. So where does crypto policy go? I, I think... It's, look, so I work at FTX. I used to not work at FTX. I worked at a law firm. I serviced sort of the broader financial markets. I, I, I read the room and I, I said, this crypto thing is not going away. This, this is one of these, you know, multi multi decade innovations, it, it brings so much efficiency to the way that value transfers, value is stored, and the way that folks can interact with each other globally, it's not going away. And so I, I think we, we spend a ton of time in Washington, D.C., and, and in other countries talking with policymakers, and a lot of people have bought into that vision. Blockchain, distributed ledgers, the idea of trustless value transfer, um, at least on the, the transaction level basis, is not going away. It's an innovation that unlocks a lot of potential. And so I, I'm not an evangelist for it, but I, I think it's not going away. And I'm starting to see policymakers like dive in with that same level of commitment. So the policy is going to be how do we support this, unlocking the value, encouraging innovators and creators to unlock the value of what distributed ledgers, blockchain, et cetera, can do for us. Um, that's where the policy is going. I don't know exactly what else that means, but you're seeing, like, if you want to get elected in the United States in a contentious jurisdiction, this is an interesting outplay of this. You know, there, are, there, are fund, there is funding that comes in for candidates who are openly pro-crypto and openly pro, like, the idea of innovation. It hasn't double-clicked yet. It's not more specific than saying, you know, the idea of blockchain is a good one and there's some transformational something there, but um, it, it, the policy is trending towards let's, let's let it happen. Great. Um, so thinking about future kind of... Um, regulation. I'd like to get your take on how do you see Bitcoin and, and blockchain kind of fundamentally altering market structures and what do you think the implications on the regulatory um, system should be? Sure. That, that's a good question. That's a really big question. So how is, how is Bitcoin and blockchain going to change market structure? Let, let's just stay on that discrete question. The, the, the great opportunity set is that the first thing that, that Bitcoin at least solved is the ability to send value from A to B on a truly trustless basis. This is, you know, you could have come to this conference, this is the ninth annual MIT Bitcoin conference, you could have come to the first one and learned that. Trustless transfer of value between two parties. That's a huge innovation. Um, the next step is trustless management of risk between two or more parties. Um, so it's not a single moment in time transfer of value, but a, a stretch of time, a range of time, risk exposure between one or more counterparties. How do we manage that on a trustless basis? The only good way we've done it, and we haven't done it perfectly as a society, is central counterparties, clearing houses, um, and look, we, we have a central clearing party as part of the FTX line of business. And there are several products that are coming out, and they're called DeFi or decentralized finance, Every, everyone follows this, where the, the value proposition is a trustless management of risk between counterparties on an open basis, not a transaction, one open and shut transaction, but an ongoing risk management program that's trustless. And it, if that happens and can happen at the scale of global finance, so a million, two million, 10 million moments per second of, of bids, offers, trades, um, you know, cancels, rejects, modifications. If you can move a market and a, a risk management program into a decentralized trustless basis, 
you don't need market structure anymore. You've, you've gotten rid of all of Wall Street. Um, I still live in New York. I live very close to Wall Street. I don't think it's going away. But um, if, if you solve for that, I mean, it, DeFi theoretically solves for all of global finance. So it, it, it completely disrupts um, traditional market structure. I, I think we're a long ways from there, though. One, I mean, to say that you could go and do a, a, a million or even 10,000 you know, actions per second on a, a blockchain that you would need on a traditional exchange, it, it's not realistic at the moment. So assuming we end up reaching that goal, what does the appropriate regulatory regime look for that? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good question too, whereas if you've got no central actor, if there's no, if there's no gate around which you can make rules, um, I think you're gonna see regulators look for an actor. Sometimes the actor is gonna be a large participant, sometimes that can be a high volume of transactions, high volume of value at risk. The government's gonna look for the large users of a given system, whether that's a protocol, an exchange, or whatever, and say, here are the things we worry about. And you go back to investor protection, market integrity, financial crimes, and they're gonna think about new ways to solve those. For example, if you've got a, one thing we've seen come out in the financial crimes area, there are certain wallets that are blacklisted by U.S. sanctions authorities. They've got no idea who the people are behind those wallets. If they could, they would just find them and arrest them. But there are certain wallets that, that are blacklisted by the U.S., I, I think it's or the U.S. financial crimes authorities. And they've said all the transactions we see going to that wallet tend to be in and around what we see as financial crimes. And so, and, and that's, that's largely AI driven. It's about analytics of the, the data that you can get in connection with anonymous transactions. And that's gonna continue to grow as well. So AI based, analytics based regulation versus prescriptive based regulation. Great. Um, so uh, we have a couple more minutes here and, and trying to rush through a few questions. Sure. Um, what do you see as the main kind of gaps or misalignments in today's regulatory framework? You know, there's a large moat around the cost to be regulated, the cost to get started up and turn on your business is much higher than, so the, the regulatory and legal cost is much higher than in many cases the technical cost. I can find really talented people and in 10 days they can build a great product um, that's, that's peer reviewed, um, audited on the code, et cetera, that works, but they can't release it without 14 months of regulation application and a million and a half dollars of lawyer's fees. And we're lawyers, we're not against that, but everyone else seems to be. I, I do appreciate the job security, yeah. for sure. Um, so m maybe going back to one thing you said earlier to just try to unpack it, this idea of kind of like a principle-based uh, regulatory regime versus a technology-specific um, regulatory regime. I think a lot of us like to think that like, you know, Bitcoin is an innovation that requires a new framework. How do you get there without being technology specific? It, it's, so how do you get to, well, how do you get to the regulation of Bitcoin without being technology specific? I mean, at the highest level, right, don't do fraud. And now we leave it to the judges, we leave it to the courts to figure out what is fraud. And so that's, that is like the highest level. Don't do fraud, don't lie, don't release materially incomplete statements. That then creates a basis for liability. Liability from a criminal authority, be it a Department of Justice, or liability in a civil context. And, and you can go way past don't do fraud. You can do, you know, please provide a disclosure along these lines. But once you get to, you know, only do transactions with these six types of individuals for these six purposes on these six times of day, then you've, lo you've lost, right? You've now created a business model defining regulatory program rather than a principles-based regime around which people can innovate. And so it's, I mean, it, it, it's pretty obvious, but that's, that's how I think about it. Principles-based regulation is really important, particularly as technology evolves super quickly um, because you can't prescribe a business model. You don't know what the business model is going to be. Um, so now that we're getting towards the end, I'd like to really zoom in into a specific kind of FTX issue. Um, so FTX US is petitioning the CFTC uh, to allow uh, for consumer-facing margin trading. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could kind of speak about the product and then speak about the changes that you guys are seeking in like your license. Sure, sure, yeah, no, it, it, we're happy to. This, this is a big initiative of ours. So I, I mentioned 200, 200 billion, give or take, some less, some more global derivatives volume daily. 
a de minimis amount of that trades in the United States, and we think a major reason is in the United States, derivatives exchanges are regulated by the CFTC. We have a license and we have a clearinghouse license. Um, to date, all the trading in derivatives in the U.S. trades on a daily basis. There's a, there's a nightly close, and it's closed on the weekends, too. So you, you've, had ex, you've had experiences over time where risk actually builds up while the market is closed and individuals aren't able to trade. Globally, crypto derivatives markets trade 24-7. So that, that's the first innovation we've asked the CFTC to do. For our U.S. derivatives market, we've petitioned for approval to list products on a 24-7 basis. And more importantly than list products is to do the risk margining program on a 24-7 basis. If your position goes underwater at 11 p.m. at night, we're able to close out that position by 11.30, by 11.15, depending on market conditions. We don't need to wait till the next morning. If it happens to be a Friday night, we don't need to wait until Monday morning. We think this introduces a ton of efficiency into the way that markets can be monitored, surveilled, and managed from a risk perspective, and so we've asked for permission to do that. And, and the proof of why it's a good idea, and we've spent thousands of hours with the CFTC, and they continue to engage very productively with us, as does all of Washington, D.C., but explaining that in the global derivatives market, this has been done for several years, and th there's a lot of lessons learned, but there's a lot of good risk management practices that, that you can bring in for 24-7 risk management that make it in many respects better than the traditional model that's used in the United States. The second innovation we want to do on top of 24-7 risk risk margining is direct to user access of the markets. A lot of the U.S. market has traditionally accessed derivatives through an intermediary, such as a broker. And that is, that is not something that we're saying shouldn't be there. Brokers are more than welcome to bring user flow to FTX. We're, we're doing a lot of work to sign up what, what are called FCMs in the, in the U.S. futures market, so futures brokers to our exchange. But we also want to, as a parallel market access model, permit anyone to show up and create their own account with the exchange and the clearinghouse. Um, we can make an app. It plugs into our Amazon cloud service in Virginia. You don't need a special technology team to create access to the FTX exchange, and it's really straightforward to go straight to users. And so that's the other thing we've asked for permission for. Great. Um, so we focused a lot um, on this talk on financial products, but you guys also have an NFT platform. Um, so I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit kind of what are some of the regulatory issues around NFTs? Sure, so yeah, we have a centralized NFT exchange and marketplace. It means that folks can load up their NFTs from different blockchains. Right now we support Ether and Solana, and they can essentially put them into their FTX wallet and buy and sell them with other FTX users. Um, NFTs have been fun. I think that's, that's the initial adjective I would use. They've, they've allowed for communities to create new ways of engagement, and we wanted to find a way to support that. I'm not sure where NFTs go um, w without a lot more innovation, and th that innovation is happening, but as a pure, you know, create interesting pictures and sell them back and forth, um, th there's a lot more that can be done there. And, and, and I think it's gonna be about community engagement. Um, some of the interesting challenges if you run a centralized NFT marketplace are the same ones that happen if you run a centralized crypto spot exchange. You've got a KYC users, which we're doing, um, and that, that's, that's a feature that makes us less competitive versus some of the other NFT platforms out there. And we, we do a lot of content moderation, essentially to make sure that anything that is listed, the listers have the IP rights, that the content is appropriate content. And so it's, it's been a really fun project for us. We've had some enthusiastic uh, staffers uh, go out and create new types of communities and engagement programs, and I think that will continue. Um, does it become a parallel to the spot crypto exchange from market's perspective? I don't know. I do, the, I do though, think that it continues to be like a community engagement thing, and we haven't seen even near the beginning of what that can be. Um, Did he just kick us off? I'm, I'm looking around. I feel like we're <laughs> at time, yeah. Okay. Do we have time for any questions? Are we done? Sure. Yeah, we have time for one question. One question. You're the moderator. <laughs> yeah, it was very quick on the draw. Taking notes too. Thank you very much for the presentation. Oh, thanks Super for coming. Um, where do the analogies between traditional finance and DeFi um, break? And because that's going to be what requires the real um, regulatory innovation. And where do you see that going? Yeah, so I said, where do the analogies between traditional finance and DeFi break? I don't really know, but. Um, 
I, I think in traditional finance, you got a lot of volume and trading activity that was tied to credit and the ability to, in fact, trust your counterparty and the ability of the large uh, central, the large banks, not the central banks, top five, top 10 global banks to intermediate with credit. That allowed for a lot of transaction activity that never would have happened. In DeFi, you can no longer go to Goldman or JP Morgan and say, you know, give me a $100 million line of credit based on my business and let me go into the markets and create transaction activity. It's DeFi, it's a completely different model. And so there will be credit that comes from somewhere. It's gonna, there'll be risk that builds up in the system. Regulators understand credit and risk, or at least they've done decades of work to understand credit and risk at banks and how that's provided. They don't yet understand how credit and risk exist in decentralized protocols, and they're gonna have to learn and then figure out what they wanna do about it, as opposed to prohibit it. Thanks for coming. <laughs>